Hey, how's it going? You good? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I hope you're better than that, but it's fine. Um, I'll not be offended. Um, I'm excited to be here. I hope you are too, but well, uh, you didn't give me much to go on there. Um, I am excited to be here and get to talk to you, and I hope that you are excited uh, to hear what God is going to say to you through his word today. I'm excited about this. Hey, can I tell you a story real quick? Um, not that I've ever told a quick story, but hey, um, can I tell you the story of how, I'm the kids pastor here, can I tell you the story of how I joined the kids team? So when I joined this church, I wanted to serve, and you're like, good, good call. And I wanted to join the worship team, and this is like 2009, and I guess like from 2002 through to about 2010, the main way that I served God was by leading worship or playing guitar in a band. And like I did that all the way through uni and like we were pretty good and we got invited to like play at conferences and things. It was fun, I really liked it. And I would have considered that my main thing. So I wanted to join the worship team and I did. And I played in the worship team for like a year and a bit until Brian's wife Kelly found out that I was training to be a teacher. And she asked me to join the kids team. And I remember at the time thinking that I was pretty happy doing worship and that was going to be my thing. And I guess I kind of got the whole like, ah, I'm going to be a teacher, so I'll be with the kids like all the, all the week and then the weekend. But I don't know if you know Kelly, but Kelly gets a yes. She gets you to say yes, so ta-da, I'm on the kids' team. And that's kind of the way that worked. And I remember at the time thinking, I don't really particularly want to do this, but uh, it turns out, I don't know if you know this either, but Kelly knows best. And now I'm the kids' pastor, so let's face it, it kind of worked out for me. So I can't be too annoyed at Kelly. In fact, I won't be annoyed at her at all. I'm glad she spotted that. And it's good. It's all good. So I joined the kids' team. But I joined it at, like, a different time. And now if you want to join the kids' team, you've got to do all this stuff, and you've got to fill out the forms. You need the PVG form. That's important. And you need, like, this little application form right here. And you need to get the references in, and you need to do a little quick interview and all that stuff. But back whenever I joined the kids' team, a PVG would suffice. In fact, my claim to fame, get this. I was the first ever PVG'd person at Rehope. Before that, it was Disclosure Scotland. It's like, woof, how crooksy. How do you stay so humble being the first person PVG'd? Yeah, I know, right? It, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard for me. Anyway, so that's fun. Um, I joined the kids' team. I didn't have to fill out this form, uh, but on this form, there is a really good question, and it says, what is the main reason for you wanting to be a children's volunteer at Rehope? Now, I didn't have to fill that out. And if I did have to fill it out at the time, I probably would have thought, but let's face it, not written, what's my main reason for wanting to be on the kids' team? Well, actually, I don't want to be a kids' worker, but Kelly said I should, so I'm gonna. And that's just the way it goes. It, it worked out for me, so it's fine. But I like that question. It's good. It's good for us to think about why we do what we do. And that's something that we're going to see Jesus challenging the people that he's talking to about. And he wants them to not just examine their actions, but he also wants them to examine their motives. So we are going to be looking at the next little bit in John chapter 7. And if you have got your Bibles with you this evening, that's ace. Go ahead and look that up just now. But if you don't have your Bible with you, that's not a problem. The words will be up on the screen and you can follow along there. That's cool. In fact, I think what we'll do um, is we'll just read the whole shebang through to verse 24 just so we can map out where we're going. So uh, John chapter 7 verse 10 says this. After his brothers had gone up to the festival, then he also went up, not openly, but secretly. And the Jews were looking for him at the festival, saying, where is he? And there was a lot of discussion about him among the crowds. Some were saying, he's a good man, and others were saying, no. On the contrary, he's deceiving the people still. Nobody was talking publicly about him because they feared the Jews. When the festival was already half over, Jesus went up to the temple complex and began to teach. Then the Jews were amazed and said, how does he know the scripture since he hasn't been trained? Jesus answered them, my teaching isn't mine. 
but is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will understand whether the teaching is from God or if I'm speaking on my own. The one who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why you want to kill me? (laughs) You have a demon, the crowd responded. Who wants to kill you? I did one work, and you are all amazed, Jesus answered. Consider this. Moses has given you circumcision, not that it comes from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man (gasps) on the Sabbath. Dun, dun, dun. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the laws of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. And these are the words of the Lord, and may they be blessed. Cool. Um, If you've been here the last few weeks, you'll have been tracking the kind of overarching narrative that is going on at the minute that is like Jesus has been up to a bunch of stuff. And in the case of the man who was healed that Jesus was just talking about right there when he was talking to uh, the crowds, um, he put a bunch of people's noses out of joint because he healed the guy on a Sabbath. Or like he was doing a miracle where he fed like thousands of people in a one and everyone was like, whoa, and they were amazed. And then they discovered like right quick that this was going to be crazy hard. And they quit on Jesus almost immediately, like for real, like the very next day, immediately. So over the last few installments that we've looked at of the account of Jesus' life, uh, according to John, The trend is that the support for Jesus is diminishing. And it's diminishing to the point that, as Gordon was telling us last week, that Jesus' own family, his own brothers, are at best mocking him or at worst telling him, dude, like, just take yourself on up to Jerusalem and die already because we're done with you around here. That's where we're at right now. And Jesus told his brothers that he wasn't going to go to the festival, but as we can see from this passage, like he did go, but he went in secret. And I can't really figure out whether this would be an easy thing or a difficult thing to do. Because I guess like on one hand, it's like Jerusalem, so it's a city, so it's going to have a decent population. Plus, this is a festival that the Jewish people are commanded to observe. And this is one of, if not the most joyfully celebrated festivals in all of Judaism. So I'm kind of thinking that if you were going to miss one, you probably don't want it to be this one. This is the fun one. You're going to want to come to that. So you've got all the people who normally live in Jerusalem, plus all the people who are like all the Jewish people from the, surround, from the whole country who are going to descend on Jerusalem, or actually no, ascend to Jerusalem so that they can take part in the festival. And uh, Jewish people who live in other territories, they have their own deal for uh, celebrating that. But point is, there's going to be a lot of people, right? So blending in, you're going to be able to do it. But then, on the other hand, I'm thinking, have you ever been to, like, a big Christian, like, festival or whatever? And I'm thinking my own experience. I'm thinking Northern Ireland, and I'm thinking Summer Madness. And you go to Summer Madness, right? And there's a bunch of people there, and you are guaranteed to see every living soul that you've ever set eyes on in your whole life, whether you want to or not. And that's just kind of the way it works. And sometimes, more people just means more people who can recognize you. So, uh, blending in. Is it going to be simple? I don't know. But it is going to be necessary. Because, I mean, opinion is divided on Jesus in Galilee. But we're in Jerusalem now. Like, this is the big time. It's always been more hostile for Jesus in Jerusalem. And if we think about, like, the last time that Jesus was here, we saw that hostility. And opinion is divided here to not just divided but polarized and like yeah there's some people who are still saying Jesus is a good guy and all that but other people are saying no in fact not only is he not good but he's lying he's deceiving he is evil divided opinion yes polarized opinion 
Yes, there's definitely no room for sitting on a fence in Jerusalem. But still, Jesus is a hot topic, right? Everybody's talking about him. The Jewish leaders are talking about him, and they're all looking for him, and the people are all talking about him. But they're talking in secret because of this fear, and it's just like a cauldron, man. It's crazy. Like, Jesus is out of Galilee's frying pan and into the fire of Jerusalem. It's always been hostile. Like, the last time he was there, he healed a guy on the Sabbath. Everybody, like all the Jewish leaders, were super mad about it. But Jesus said, I've just healed you, given you physical healing. Do you want to go a step further and receive eternal spiritual healing? Do you want to believe in me? And the guy was like, no. Why did he say that? Well, because he was too scared. And the climate of fear has not changed. And the grudge that the Jewish leaders are hanging on to has not changed. In fact, the only thing that's really changed in the intervening period is that now the people in Galilee have beef with Jesus. And guess what? They've packed it all up in their suitcases and they've brought it with them to Jerusalem. Fun. Can't wait for this. And this is the opposite of what this festival should be. This is supposed to be the joyful festival where the people celebrate a bunch of stuff. They celebrate God's provision. This festival happens at the end of the harvest season and marks the end of the agricultural year. So they're celebrating all the things that God has provided for them for a whole year. Plus, at this stage, they remember that God brought them out of the land of slavery through the desert and into the land he promised them. This is a really big, happy, exciting thing that is going on. Leviticus 23 sets this festival up where God commands the people, on the first day, you are to take the product of the majestic trees palm fronds, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and rejoice before your, the Lord your God for seven days. Or other, another translation says, celebrate with joy before the Lord your God for seven days. So celebrate with joy. That's what they're commanded to do. I mean, water is a big important symbol at this festival. And stay tuned for a bunch of Jesus' water symbolism chat in the next few weeks. But they have this like water ceremony, right? And they have this parade as part of that ceremony where they parade through the streets and they're all like playing flutes and that, which sounds a little bit Northern Irish for St. Patrick's Day weekend, but I'm gonna let that slip, it's fine. Um, and anyway, they've got all the flutes and the parades and all that stuff and they're chanting. The people are chanting Psalm 118. And that's the one that's like, give thanks to God for he is good, his love endures forever. So this is a joyful occasion, really joyful. In fact, it was such a big thing that one ancient rabbi wrote, anyone who has not seen this water ceremony has never ever seen rejoicing in his life. This is the epitome of rejoicing. God says celebrate with joy celebrate with joy (laughs) this isn't like what's happening in John chapter 7 isn't the people getting together to celebrate with joy like this isn't a hold nothing back pour all of your rejoicing and exuberant acts of thankfulness and worship out before the Lord this is restraint and this is like extreme caution and being careful what you say in front of whom because homeboy might be listening and he might tell the Jewish leaders and then you'll get in trouble. And I mean, people are, are, have divided opinions about Jesus, but the thing that is uniting them at the minute is not joy, it's fear. And that's what Jesus is working with. That's the setting for Jesus as he goes to do his teaching. And this bit has really like made me like kind of shift my thinking to how I read uh, Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees. I guess before that, I always would have read those interactions along the lines of the Pharisees coming up and being all like, and Jesus is like, dude. And everyone's like, and then it's easy and Jesus isn't under any pressure whatsoever. And he just like sasses them up and on your way and like, that's it. But this is tense, right? This is really tense, and we see that Jesus is under real pressure, and it's, ugh, it's uncomfortable. That's what he's working with. That's the setting for his teaching. But let's, uh, let's have a little look at what he is teaching, and let's give ourselves a little reminder and read verses 14 to 19 again, which say, when the festival was already half over, Jesus went up to the temple complex and began to teach 
Then the Jews were amazed and said, how does he know the scriptures since he hasn't been trained? Jesus answered them, my teaching isn't mine, but is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will understand whether the teaching is from God or if I am speaking on my own. The one who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you want to kill me? All right, first things first. Jesus goes up to the temple complex to teach, and we kind of think, yeah, makes sense get it because like jesus is jesus and he teaches and that's what he does but we can see from this passage that it's not just taken for granted that jesus would be a teacher in fact the people who are listening to him are kind of taken aback a little bit by not by what he's saying per se but just kind of by who he is they take a little step back because jesus understanding of the scriptures is so so impressive that even his enemies have to sit up and pay attention to that. And we're in the temple in Jerusalem here, you guys. It's not like we're in some like backwater synagogue where they can't get a rabbi for love nor money and nobody knows which way is up. This is the temple. And this is a festival where like every rabbi in, Jer- in Israel is gonna be in Jerusalem. There is no shortage of experts in the scriptures who are gonna be at that temple yet Jesus is still head and shoulders above everybody else to the extent that they are all wowed by him. They are amazed and they have to admit that they are up against something here. Amazed for real, but they question Jesus. Where did he learn this? How does he know all this? So I've been teaching the kids on a Sunday morning Um, at We Hope about uh, the 12 disciples over the last little while. And we started with what it means to be a disciple. And we started with how somebody would get to be a disciple. And we discovered that it's all kind of like linked in and tied up with the early first century Jewish educational system. And uh, boring, right? Hey kids, what do you want to talk about today? Like school 2000 years ago? Okay. How I know God is with me is that the kids don't go home every week being like, that was so boring. Anyway, it's chill. So here's how first century school worked in, uh, in Palestine. When you were a girl or a boy of about five years old, you would start school. And your school is that you need to learn the first five books of the Bible. You've got to learn, memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So easy, right? And you finish that when you're 10. And if you're a girl, you're done with school. Congratulations, you've graduated. If you're a boy, you're done with school. Congratulations. Unless you are so, so impressive that you might be invited to continue your studies. Like probably up until uh, your bar mitzvah at 13, but maybe beyond that until you're about 15. And up until that stage, then you're kind of working towards memorizing the whole of the rest of the Old Testament, all the prophets, all the history, all the poetry, all of it. And once you've memorized it all at 15, you're done. Quit school. And then you would go and you would get a job, like probably learning the job that your dad did, and you would get a job and that'd be it. Unless you are truly amazing. And then you would be afforded the chance to approach a rabbi and you could ask him, can I be your disciple? And if and only if he thinks you are incredible, the best of the best, and if he thinks you have got what it takes, he will say yes. And it's at that point that the training and the education takes a little shift in emphasis. And now I'm about to get all teachery and boring on you, so fair warning. Um, But up until this point, the education that they have received is focused solely on memorization. The boys need to be able to remember and recite the scriptures. So if you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy of higher order thinking skills, I know, right? You'll know that the lowest order thinking skill is remembering. And that's all they deal with. So I've tried to find the most teachery image I could get. Um, Get this, right? Isn't that disgusting? This 
this is teachers. It's like, oh, I can't even, I'm glad I'm standing on this side of the screen so I don't have to look at it. Anyway, so whenever you get to be someone's disciple, that's when you move on from thinking solely about memorizing it and being able to remember it and being able to recite it. You get to follow that rabbi and you get to think about how you can understand not just what the scripture says, but what it means and how you can apply it to your life. How can you do that? And you're looking at that rabbi and you're analyzing his actions and you're kind of like thinking all about this and evaluating what he does and you're thinking, how can that work for me so that I can meet my goal? And the goal of a disciple is becoming exactly like a rabbi in every way. You want to be exactly like him. And that's what you're going for. And if you finish your training as a disciple, probably around the age of 30, then you're done. Congratulations. You have finished your training. Unless you are truly amazing and then you would get the chance to call disciples of your own and get to be a rabbi yourself and you would get to teach places and that is the kind of training that the Jewish leaders are talking about here thing is they say how does Jesus know about the scriptures since he wasn't trained he wasn't ever anybody's disciple he didn't finish all this stuff and it just was not normal for somebody who would teach in synagogues and temples and be recognized as a rabbi, which Jesus did do. He was recognized as a rabbi. Or for someone to call disciples, which Jesus did, if they hadn't finished this training because actually they'd only been thinking about the lowest order thinking skill. They'd only been able to remember it. They didn't know what it meant and how to do and, and all of that stuff. This has been an issue for Jesus already in his ministry. When he was in Nazareth and he was talking and everyone was like, wait, hang on a minute. Isn't that that carpenter's kid? And it's not because they hate carpenters and they're like, oh, I wouldn't believe anything a carpenter ever said to me. It's because Jesus finished school and he went to learn from a carpenter and he learned how to be a carpenter and that was his training. He didn't learn to be a rabbi. And they're like, why should I listen to you? You talk to me about carpentry? Then I'll listen to you. Here, mate, I need you to fix my table. Then I'll listen to you. But you haven't finished your training. They're doubting Jesus' credentials and what qualifies him to teach. And I'm just like, Why? Why did Jesus not finish his training? Because then he could have just avoided all of this hassle. So there was this kid in my year in high school. He's called Eddie. And he grew up in Japan. Um, his dad, like it was, his whole family were Irish, but his dad worked in Japan. And I think he, he only moved back from Japan whenever we were about to start high school. So he grew up there. He knew all that stuff. And whenever we were in first year of high school, he did GCSE Japanese. And whenever he was in third year of high school, he did A-level Japanese. And I remember it being such a big deal that a first year had a GCSE. So if you're Scottish and you're like, if you want clued in, you normally do a GCSE when you're 15. He did it when he was 11. And you normally do an A-level when you're 18. He did it when he was 13. But I mean, he grew up in Japan. He spoke and wrote fluent Japanese. It was easy. So he aced it. Why wouldn't you do it? It's like a free qualification. Why wouldn't you do it? And I'm thinking, Jesus, you could have just aced this, mate, because you were well ahead of the curve. Like you got lost in Jerusalem and you were at the temple. And even then, when you were 12 years old, completely wowing the experts of the law because you clearly know what you're talking about. He could have just aced it. And then he could have avoided all that. So it's like, why? Why didn't he? I can make that sound quite simple, but I'm not actually sure that it is that simple. And it's the bit where you follow a rabbi around and want to be exactly like him that poses the problem. Because for everybody else, they're thinking like this is their chance to do those higher order thinking skills. So they're going to grow and learn so fast and like just boom, skyrocket. But for Jesus, I mean, Jesus has a deeper clearer, more accurate understanding of the scriptures than any rabbi ever has done. So if he were to become exactly like a rabbi, it would drag him down. He didn't finish his training because he was above that. He didn't need it. He was better than that. 
So why would he do it? He was better than that. But the Jewish leaders don't see that, do they? They just see like this young rabbi who rocks up and he's like chatting all this chat and it's new stuff and they have got a few options for how they could respond to it and they could just be like oh my goodness this stuff is gold tell me more I believe you this is amazing they could believe him but (laughs) Jesus and the Jewish leaders like really that never happened okay so either that or they could get all their like heresy alarm bells ringing and be like this young guy is coming into my temple and teaching and like he doesn't know what he's talking about and he's teaching all this rubbish and what are we going to do about it but they don't do that They don't try and discredit Jesus' message. In fact, they know that he's legit. The question that they have is, how does he know what he's talking about? Because he knows what he's talking about. That's just accepted. The third option that they have is that they can recognize that he does know what he's talking about, because he does, and that he speaks with authority, and he does, but they can choose to not believe on the grounds that they question the source of Jesus' authority. And this is something that they come back to again and again and again. They have like questions about where Jesus gets his authority to teach. They have questions about where Jesus gets his authority to heal or to do miracles. And eventually, later on in the narrative, they come to the conclusion that Jesus gets the source of his power straight from the devil which Jesus refutes strongly because it has absolutely no factual basis. It's completely wrong. He sets him straight then, and he sets him straight now. So when I'm reading this, right, I'm reading it, and I kind of am getting like, uh, Jesus is frustrated, but he's being patient, even though he's frustrated. Because if I was Jesus and I was being faced with all this stuff, I'd be sniffing a classic John's Gospel I am statement coming up. I'd be thinking, you want to know where I learned this? Like, you really want to know who taught me the word? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You want to know where I learned this? Dude, I am the lesson. And everyone be like, oh yeah, wow, Jesus, woof, this is amazing. That sounds like it could fit right in, but Jesus doesn't do that. I'm thinking they should just recognize, but Jesus is a little bit more patient with them. And he does go on to explain that he doesn't get his message from a rabbi. He didn't get trained by a rabbi. In fact, it's better because he gets his message straight from the one who sent him, straight from God. He's setting himself up as a higher authority because he didn't learn from people straight from God. And he says, if you really follow the scriptures that you claim to value so much, you would recognize this, you guys. You really would. He's above the training and he gets his message straight from God, but Jesus isn't done here. He wants the Jewish people to know how they could recognize it. And they could recognize it because Jesus, it, Jesus' integrity is greater than that of the Jewish leaders. So this part is kind of twofold. And I guess we have integrity in the sense of the way that we normally think about integrity. And that is that if you say you're going to do something, then you should actually go on ahead and do that. And Jesus makes it clear what he thinks of the integrity of the Jewish leaders, or to be honest, the lack thereof. And he says, you are all chatting about how you love this law so much, but none of you do it. So what's up with that? What is up with that? Jesus doesn't have much time for people who lack integrity and therefore are hypocritical about it. And Jesus calls us to honor our commitments. If we say we're going to do something, then we should do it. So I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about my own commitment levels, and I think that Jesus is calling us all to think about our commitment levels for, you know, if you say you're going to do something, that you should do it. Do you know, are you in a Bible read-through group? And Are you consistently prioritizing finishing your reading and meeting with your group and sharing the Bible? Like, how are you doing with that? You know, just be thinking, like, right now, how are you doing with that? Or have you said you're going to serve on a team in the church 
and how's like how's that going are you finding that like you're committed to that and you're keeping your word or are you finding that like other things are stealing your attention away and your priorities maybe lie elsewhere it's like how you doing or, or have you made a commitment to give financially to the church are you doing that like how, how's it going and, and these are things like commitments that we've made some of us that we've made that we should make sure that we honor i mean simple things like do you show up on time little things are important in terms of keeping our commitment something to think about like jesus wants us to know that keeping our commitments and having integrity in that is important but he has more than that and he wants us to go a little bit deeper into the whole integrity thing because right for example i could tell you that i will come round to each of your flats and i will clean them from top to bottom until they sparkle and i could do that it would take me a while but i could do it and i could keep my word but that doesn't really sound like something that I would like to do, to be honest. And I would probably come round and do that with a bit of a miserable attitude. And you would be justified in thinking, why did he even say that he was going to do that if he really doesn't want to? Like there is keeping your word, but then there's keeping your word with a joyful heart, doing what God calls you to do with a joyful heart. Because if we want to follow God properly, we can't do that with a miserable heart. And Jesus is calling us to integrity of our actions, but also in our motives. And he's saying, like, if you are, like, working for the one who sent you, then you're going to be doing it for God's glory. And if you're aiming for God's glory, then you will be true to your message, you'll keep your word, you'll keep your commitments, and then you will also build up your righteousness. There will be no unrighteousness in you because your actions will be good and there'll be righteousness in your heart. Your motives will be good too. That's what Jesus is calling us to. Sweet. So let's pause for a moment and remind ourselves of where Jesus is going with this. And we'll read um, verses 20 through to 24. Give me a little moment here. Mm. Thanks, you guys. So Jesus just asked the people, why they want to kill him and they say you have a demon the crowd responded who wants to kill you i did one work and you're all amazed jesus answered consider this moses has given you circumcision i mean not that that comes from moses but from the fathers and you circumcise a man on the sabbath and if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. So, let me get back to my form real quick. I didn't fill this out, but if I were going to, and I'm thinking about my motives, what are the main reasons for you wanting to volunteer as a children's worker? I suppose the main reasons I have for wanting to volunteer as a children's worker are that I get to teach the kids and I get to tell the stories and I love that. It brings me so much life, it brings me so much joy and these reasons are all about me and I get to do this and I get to do that and God gives me this and I get that and it's all about me. It's pretty egocentric that. But hang on, right, pause. Does that make, does that, is, are those really bad motives? Does that make those bad motives? Like, is getting joy from God, like, really that bad a motive? It seems legit to me. And, like, I'm the kids' pastor here, so I am hoping that they're good motives. But if it's not, it puts me in a bit of a weird position. But Jesus says God's glory. So I'm kind of thinking about this, and I'm wrestling with this, and I'm thinking, how do these things, which seem pretty legit, fit with the whole God gets glory bit. I'm thinking about that, and I'm reading Deuteronomy from my Bible read-through this week, and I'm reading the Ten Commandments, and I read things like, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, 
do not have other gods besides me. And that's the way that that works. This is what God has done for you. And just simply because of who he is, you should follow this law. He's saying, I'm your God. I did that. Don't even think about worshiping anybody else. And that's just how that works. Some laws work because God is worthy of us following him just because of who he is and because of what he's done. And we should do that. But I'm also reading things like this. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and so that you may prosper in the land the Lord your God has given you. So this commandment, and it's only like a few verses later, but this commandment has a different vibe going on, doesn't it? The other one was like, do this because God. And this one's like, well, hey, if you do this thing, then this good thing will happen for you. Okay, that's different. And the thing is, there's something that's like a little bit like, err, in my head. And the tempting thing for us that I think we think about more than we maybe realize is that it's so easy for us to have an attitude that creeps in of, yeah, hang on, what's in it for me though? Like, I'll do that thing for you. What's in it for me? And I think that attitude can creep in. Like Jesus saying the Jewish leaders have that attitude. They're like, yeah, I'll follow your God, or I'll follow your r- rules, God, but what's in it for me? And what they want is they want honor in society. They want the respect, and there's the whole pride and prestige that goes along with it. They want a share of the glory. I'll keep your law, God. Yeah, for real, but I want a share of the glory. That's my price. And I can make it sound a little bit nicer and a little bit more palatable. But I'm thinking those motives like my answer for this form is something along the lines of yeah i mean i'll i'll follow you god like i'll serve your kids team or whatever but i want joy and i want life that's my price and i made it sound like it was kind of legit but now i'm thinking oh here hang on should those really be my motives because i think it's really dangerous to have our motives for following God be about us getting a blessing. Because, I mean, what happens whenever you, uh, whenever you serve God and you do something right and you don't get a blessing? And then you're like, oh, I knew that God was with me because I did the thing and then he gave me the blessing. But this time I did do the thing and he didn't. So does this mean God has disappeared? What's up with that? And we're starting to doubt. Or you're like, oh, I only did that thing so that I would get a blessing and I didn't get a blessing. So I'm not going to do that next time. No way. And our, like, our appetite for following God and our desire and our drive to follow God just goes boom down the tube because we don't get the blessing. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. And even when we read that commandment about honoring your father and mother, it's easy for us to read it like honor your father and mother because then you'll live a long time and you'll get to stay in the land that God gave you when it doesn't actually say that. That's like our brain editing It actually says, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you can live a long life and get to stay in the land that God gave you. And yes, sometimes God acts in kindness towards us. That's his prerogative. That's his deal. And we can see from this commandment right here, but like, dude, there's like a bunch of them in Deuteronomy that are like saying like if you follow me I'll send the rain and if you follow me you'll get to live here a long time and if you follow me there'll be peace in the land and if you follow me the crops will grow and if you follow me you'll have places to live and all that stuff there is loads of stuff that it's like if you do this then I will bless you but for every command in the Old Testament and the New like that there's another bit that comes along and it's Jesus saying if anybody wants to be my disciple they need to be ready to take their cross up And they will hate you because they hated me first. And you'll recognize that in your life, right? You'll recognize times whenever you have followed God and done something that honors him and there has been fruit from that and he has blessed you in that and you've received joy, for example. You'll also be able to pinpoint times in your life when you have followed God faithfully and you have faced direct opposition because of it. Sometimes we get the blessing Sometimes we don't. 
And if we like give that to God and I did this thing so God bless me, does that also mean that then like I did this thing and God punished me for doing something that honored him? Because that doesn't really make sense to me at all. It's a bad attitude to only follow God so that we get the blessing. But it's also just bad theology. It's not how grace works. Like it's not how God works. God does give freely. He blesses freely. Yes, he does. Same as whenever you do something, it's not that he's decided to punish you. God doesn't work that way. Like Psalm 103. The Lord does not treat you according to your sins deserve. He doesn't treat you according to your iniquities. Why? Because as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great the love of our Lord is. That's what God is like. That's the way he works. That's the way he's always worked. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He gives freely. He doesn't treat us according to our actions. I mean, otherwise, it's like you do a good thing, and it's like God's seen that and been like, ooh, I spotted that. Nice one. Here, hang on a minute. Is it going to be a blessing or is it going to be a punishment? Let's see. Oh, dude, sorry. It's a punishment. Oh, that's awkward. God's not like that. God's faithful. He doesn't flip a coin in his head. God is faithful to his promises. So, like, I still get life and I still get joy out of teaching the kids because God is faithful to his promises and he is good. But that's not my main thing for doing that. That's not my main thing anymore. So, I mean, I want to come back to this form again. I want to have another go at this. This is my third go, and I hope to get it right this time. And I'm going to get, I'm going to Deuteronomy it, and I'm going to think, what's God like? What has he done for me? And how can I give him glory? Right, okay, so my reasons for wanting to do kids work at Rehope are God is a savior, and he rescued me from slavery to sin when I was a kid. And I want to be part of that. I know he still does that. I want to be a part of it. And I want to be a part of God receiving glory when more kids decide that they want to give their lives to Jesus and follow him for their whole lives. That's why I do that. And that's exciting. That's really exciting. I love that. And will I still get to tell the stories and do the things I like to do? Yes, I will. Sweet, but it's not my main motivation. And will I still get joy out of that? Yes, I will, but it's not my main motivation. And I think that these things like, are like, pretty legit. And is it okay if you pray and you ask God, can I get some more joy, please? Yes, of course, because God is still faithful to his promises and he still blesses. But we're looking towards him and his glory, number one. Some days we have good days at work, am I right? Some days we have bad days at work or at uni or at school or whatever. And if you have, like, if I have a good day at work and I'm up with the kids and I teach them and I'm just like buzzing off it and it's great, that doesn't mean that I think, okay, that means I'm going to go to work tomorrow. You just go to work the next day, right? And if I have a really bad day or whatever and I'm really tired or whatever's happening, I don't think, right, that's it. I quit. (laughs) I mean, that's dumb. That's not how it works. We need something more consistent and we need something more, like, reliable and we need something more faithful to be our motive for following God. And we need that to be God's glory. That's what Jesus sets up as our prime motive and that's what we're going for so i'm thinking about my professional deal and all that stuff and i guess that's quite easy for me to take this and apply it to my work because i work at church and everything's all like tangled up with god's kingdom and, and kids becoming christians and all that stuff but the bible says whenever you work you work for god not for men or women so i think we can definitely still apply this same way of thinking to our, our work no matter what we do. Like if you are working in, and like, I don't know, you know what's going on. Think of what your main thing is. And I want you to consider, maybe you haven't before, but I want you to consider 
how you can give God glory in that. What are your motives for doing that right now? And how you can give God's glory or God glory in that, you know, and I want you to think, how can I give God glory as a doctor or an engineer or as a student or as like a school pupil or as like a full-time mom or a full-time dad, whatever your main thing is. Be thinking, how can I give God glory? What are my motivations right now? What do I need to do a little bit of a tweak in so that I can readjust and refocus so that my intentions and my motives are pure. And when we do this, when we've got our eyes set properly, we've got something to aim for. And we know what we're driving towards, and it means that we're able to think, actually, am I doing this? Is what I'm doing giving God glory? And it it helps us to self-reflect, and it helps us then we'll know what to confess and how we can repent and readjust and all that stuff. It's really, really helpful to think not just about actually what you do, that is important, but also about why you do it. That's also really important. I've got a couple of challenges for you this evening um, that I'll let you know just before we move into a time of reflection. Two um, kind of thinking uh, challenges, I suppose. So the first one, I want you to think about what you do. Like, what's your main thing? And I want you to think about what your motives for that are. And I want you to think about how you can give God glory. Maybe write them down and then pray through each bit of it and commit yourself to doing them so that your motives are good. And I guess I'm asking you to apply this to like a professional or a study context. But I think it's something that is quite... um, quite natural to think of it in that sphere and then once you've kind of got that going on you can apply it more widely so have a think about that first of all and then secondly identify things that you do at your place of work or your place of study or in your home and depending on what your main thing is that act as barriers to you bringing glory to God I want you to confess them I want you to repent of them I want, them to, you, I want you to eradicate them from your practice. Strong word, I read Deuteronomy this week. Deuteronomy says, purge the evil from among you. Be ruthless, get rid of it. Some challenges, I hope uh, they will be helpful and I hope that, you, uh, that they help you to grow and, and I hope they help you to think uh, through this stuff.